Welcome, everyone. We appreciate your time and consideration being with us here today. Um, jumping right to uh, the heart of the matter, we are pleased to announce that our 2022 Q3 revenue was uh, $1.876 million, so just underneath $1.9 million, with product sales being $1.359 million and service sales being $516,000. We had a gross profit in Q3 of $626,908 which demonstrates a margin of, of 33.4%. At the end of September, our cash balance was $11.7 million. We are on budget as per plan <clears throat> and, uh, and expect to uh, continue with these results uh, as per budget um, uh, around the expectations of our Q4 results and our year-end um, uh, filings. Um, just as a quick overview, uh, Dragonfly is the oldest recognized often or usually as the oldest commercial drone manufacturer in the world. We've been in business since 1998. We've commercialized our first drone in 1998. And we are a total solution provider. So we are an organization that does not provide just an airframe or just a component of something that somebody in the drone industry, a customer uh, would purchase, but rather we provide full turnkey solutions. And we are able to do this, uh, frankly, because of the amount of time that we've been in, in the industry, the bench strength and the experience that we bring to the table. As noted before, we're excited about this industry for a lot of reasons, other than just being passionate about drones and what the impact will have on society, but also because today it's a $20 billion industry, which is primarily a military-focused industry um, in terms of those revenues, but it's growing to a $40-plus billion industry over the next number of years, and most of that growth will be in the commercial space, where drones, uh, excuse me, where Dragonfly is uniquely positioned, uh, we think, to own significant market share of that growth. Operational highlights uh, from the last quarter for us were in large part focused on the release and now the initial sales of our latest product lineup. Uh, we unveiled three particular new products, one being the Dragonfly Heavy Lift drone, the Dragonfly Commander 3XL drone, and the Dragonfly LiDAR system. These were uh, actually announced uh, at the end of Q2 and the beginning of Q3 and actually went on sale uh, at the end of Q3. What's really important to note and probably the statistic that I'm most pleased about in Q3 is to look at our pipeline growth and not just from... Um, uh, you know, from a very, very tactical and a very, very uh, quantitative perspective, we can see where our order sizes are now going from, you know, ones and twos and threes in terms of airframes to tens and twenties and thirties in terms of uh, order sizes. And uh, I think this is uh, for a number of reasons. One, the maturing of the industry, the ongoing clarity around regulation, and for us in particular, the actual now availability of these particular products. Uh, when we initially went public, uh, on July 31 of 2021, uh, our use of proceeds was focused on building out our capacity to be able to meet the demand, uh, which is still the overall constraint around our numbers growing. And we feel that by the end of Q2, we'll be at a, a spot where we can meet uh, demand. And uh, we'll continue to see growth, obviously, between now and then. Uh, and the other was, uh, was the, the new product lineup. So the products that you uh, see before you really are more sophisticated products than what I would suggest a number of our uh, competitors uh, are coming to market with. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a poor way or a poor reflection on them. Uh, a lot of their markets that we're seeing is tends to be towards, you know, the small blue UAV or the smaller uh, type drone um, offerings. And what we're finding is that what our customers and the customers we're dealing with, whether it's commercial, industrial, or light military, are really, really focused on uh, sophisticated center deployment or uh, payload deployment that tends to be a bit heavier. And so that's what really determines and dictates to us the airframes that we are building. <clears throat> and so 
you'll see that middle uh, drone there. That's the 3XL, which we've now had at a number of trade shows. Uh, and we see our pipelines in incredibly strong uh, looking for this particular product. This 3XL uh, is likely, the, in my opinion anyway, the most efficient drone in the market uh, today. It, it is actually quite large. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a few feet or you know, two and a half feet uh, you know, square. Uh, now it's a 26 pound drone and it can carry 24 pounds of uh, payload. So it stays underneath the 55 pound threshold uh, for uh, that, that still allows you to run under a part 107 license without having to get additional uh, permits or waivers from the FAA. That's very important. The other really key component of this particular product is that it is a direct replacement for the DJI M600, which is their heavy lift drone, which has now been discontinued. And so we're seeing huge demand uh, for this as a direct replacement for that. All the rails on this thing fit all the payloads that fit on the uh, the DGI. Uh, it's it's got a familiar type of uh, feel to it, other than it can carry a lot more uh, than uh, uh, than it's than what it's replacing, uh, and it still fits under that 55 pound uh, threshold. So uh, th this application uh, is everything from uh, again light commercial, industrial, and right through to uh, light military use. On the far left, you'll see the heavy lift drone. That's a that's a drone that's about nine feet across. And that does require special waivers to be flown by uh, uh, pilots uh, from the FAA. It has full autonomous capabilities beyond visual line of sight capabilities, uh, as does the 3XL uh, as well. And, and this particular drone right now is a little bit longer lead time, but we've got really solid demand uh, in this. And we're working on a number of BB loss uh, certificates uh, with a number of government agencies now in order to utilize this drone. This drone uh, carries an extremely efficient and heavy payload uh, and can be used for anything from additional medical delivery, cargo delivery, uh, logistics for military, uh, and et cetera. And on the far right, you'll see our LIDAR system there. So this is a LIDAR with such accuracy that typically before it would have to be flown uh, on an aircraft. And so we're now seeing a generation of LIDAR that's able to fly on a drone. And again, be because uh, so many of our customers are coming to us, not necessarily looking for a particular airframe, they're looking for a solution, but the demand uh, uh, demonstrated to us is that we actually needed to provide a turnkey solution around a LIDAR and a drone system. And that's what you see on the far right hand side. And so while this last quarter was really focused on product, it also really focused on our internal sales process, the uh, integration of our ERP systems that we had, uh, uh, installed this year, the integrations of our CRM systems. And ultimately what it means is that we now have uh, greater inbound traffic uh, driven by our PR, our IR, uh, and our customers to our website than we've ever seen. So we're collecting incredible data about what we should be building, how we should be building it, when it needs to be uh, deployed. So the whole maturing of the business right now is probably the thing that's most excited uh, to me. The demand in the market has always been there or has been there for a number of years, constrained either by capacity or moreover by regulation, both of which are opening up uh, at a really nice pace right now. <clears throat> um, I've already spoken to this a, a bit, uh, but what's really cool to see is that we now have a, have a significant wait list that's growing, in particular for the 3XL drone. And uh, we think this is going to be a particular runaway product for us uh, over the course of the next year because it's replacing a large install base of products that's out there with a higher degree of efficiency and a greater degree of sophistication and a wider range of payloads that can be used uh, on this particular drone. So uh, again, whether it's uh, light military or drone as a first responder for public uh, safety, or whether it's carrying chainsaws uh, up mountains uh, for firefighters. Uh, this thing has got all kinds of applicability and, and uh, people on the waiting list now, uh, which Paul Mullen has, uh, has things in uh, full production. I think a couple of other um, things on the product side, which are uh, uh, noteworthy, is that we did unveil uh, our product, our vital intelligence product, uh, which was born out of the pandemic uh, to the California Probation, Parole, and Correctional Association at their training conference. And uh, we see a very large pipeline now, excuse me, very large is, is tough to quantify, but we see a significant pipeline uh, now of uh, uh, in particular, correctional institutions and facilities or facilities that require intake uh, of personnel or, or um, uh, uh, patients 
or inmates or such to be able to do touchless vital signs. This isn't a, a simple thermometer temperature reading. Uh, this provides heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, blood oxygen levels, uh, and those types of things. It, and the ROI on this is that it speeds up the intake process. And it also re uh, requires um, a different type of less expensive personnel in order uh, to run it. So uh, this is something that is has really started to take off for us in directions that we didn't necessarily expect, uh, but is doing quite well. Uh, that same technology is being integrated and has been tested, obviously, on drones as well. So if we think about the applicability of this for search and rescue or for military um, uh, operations uh, or reconnaissance operations to understand troop uh, conditions and things like that, uh, the opportunity around this particular technology uh, will continue to grow. We're really excited about what's on. Uh, been unveiled here in the last uh, the last quarter on it. Um, I think it's worthy to note that, you know, uh, understanding our product positioning uh, to our shareholders and stakeholders, we think is, a, is an important thing. So down in that bottom left corner, you know, that's that's where you would see uh, maybe uh, a greater amount of consumer drones or even prosumer drones or, or a number of the DGI uh, type of, or parrot type of uh, products. Um, and th those would even be the, the small kind of like the, the blue UAS type uh, drones that are, are going into some of the military units uh, uh, and some. Um, but as you move further up into that uh, top right hand corner from the bottom left hand corner, you start under you start moving more to autonomy, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, sensor awareness, things that are really, really important and sophisticated, we think are under a greater uh, margin and are really, really important in the commercial uh, and the light military space. These are all systems here that, that we have built or worked on or that our personnel have worked on. And so you see the vast majority of them continue to skew in, in the uh, technical sophistication uh, area. And that's where we're going to continue to push uh, our market uh, as, as we see, you know, again, not, uh, we've seen this three or four times now over the last uh, at least my 15 years, and, and probably for some of the other employees who've been around even longer than that, I've seen at least three cycles of this where we've seen new entrants come into the market, and they all tend to go down to that smaller airframe. They all tend to push into what I would almost consider a prosumer space. And we're seeing right now where that is getting very crowded very quickly. Uh, so once again, we're not going to go into that space. We're going to stay up in, in this upper quadrant. And, as, and now this upper quadrant you know, uh, is is a bit more regulatory dependent, but the whole industry is regulatory dependent now. So we feel it's it's an opportune time to continue to push and, and move in this direction. Um, also, we wanted to uh, just provide an update uh, on some of the work that we've done uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, strategically, uh, we have, uh, we believe, uh, or at least our realization around work in Ukraine is that in the coming years in particular, uh, in the light military and in the commercial and industrial space, uh, if you weren't present in Ukraine, if you did not have operations in Ukraine, if you were not uh, in there, you know, learning, developing, uh, improving uh, your products, your services, your techniques, your training, all of that type of stuff with the various uh, players and stakeholders in that environment, you, you, you know, you're going to be asked why in a couple of years from now, why you weren't there, it, you know, from a perspective of like, um, excuse me, that's where all the best pilots are coming out of. It's where all the new techniques are being learned. It's where the new technology is getting battle tested literally very quickly. And so as we are, we're, what we're now already seeing in our international business, you know, whether it be India or the Middle East, one of the first questions they ask is, are you in the Ukraine? What are you learning from Ukraine? What is your equipment doing there? But, and, and because we have demonstrated the ability to be in there, in that theater, uh, and we've put people on the ground over there and we're working hand in hand with customers, we are able to speak very, very credibly uh, with uh, not just those international partners, but the customers that we're talking with back in North America as well. So, so it, the Ukraine to us is much more important than just the immediate revenue sales over the next number of years, uh, which uh, appear to be, uh, you know, trending towards being very, very significant. We'll talk about a couple of things in that regard. But more importantly, as a company that is a, you know, a focused and dedicated drone uh, uh, organization, you know, what is it that you've learned? How have you been there? What credibility do you bring to the table from having been there? And what have you learned? I certainly know from our organization, we've accelerated uh, in terms of our, our insights, our abilities, our capabilities because of the work that, uh, that we've done there. So specifically, we've done medical response drones, uh, which are uh, really 
uh, in many respects, becoming a logistics drone that can also deliver many other types of packages uh, in theater. Uh, we have done reconnaissance drones uh, in the area and, uh, and, and we'll continue to do, to do more and more of that. And the other uh, area that was not planned, but has really come across and, and is a massive market uh, is landmine detection. So it, it's gonna take 20 years to demine Ukraine, just Ukraine alone. And for every day of war, there's 30 days of, of demining that has to happen. And, and there's you know hundreds of millions of dollars of budget per year that's required to do that demining. And this isn't demining in, in uh, the, you know, remote regions that people are not uh, living. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, city uh, urban centers, it's, uh, it's areas around cities, it's areas lining uh, the rivers, it's uh, agricultural land, it's the industrial land, like it's, it's just unbelievable the amount of mining. And in fact, the entire offensive right now uh, where we see uh, um, Russia pulling out of Kyrgyzstan, they, they actually the only thing that's delaying that from even happening faster, we see it happening now, but from a couple of weeks ago, is all the mines that were laid. So there's a big, big push in this area, and, and we've got some very exciting news coming up um, uh, in that regard uh, with the amount of work that we've done, uh, the sensors that we have, uh, the flight and testing facilities that we've built, uh, et cetera. So... Um, along that area too, I, I think it's also important to note uh, that we are in, in country there. Uh, we have working relationships uh, with uh, industry, with ministry, uh, with civil uh, uh, departments on, on many, many different levels. And if you're not willing to be there doing the work, you're not going to get the work. Um, and, uh, and so the fact that we have been there and made that commitment uh, and the relationships that we built there, we think is, is going to garner us years and years of, of work, not just uh, during this very uh, unfortunate time, but during the rebuilding process for not just Ukraine, but all of uh, Eastern Europe and the inroads that that's now actually giving us in, into the European market, the credibility uh, in the MENA region um, and, uh, and in India as well uh, has been, you know, really significant. So this, this is you know, an unfortunate conflict, uh, but for a company like Dragonfly, it's uh, it, it it will turn out to be uh, an incredible um, uh, opportunity for us to to further develop our uh, abilities and and grow our organization. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Sun, our CFO, uh, to run through our specific results for Q3, and then we'll go to um, uh, some Q and A uh, from everybody uh, led by Scott Larson. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cam. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so just looking at this um, at this slide here on, on the left, um, you basically see uh, a, a caption of the income statement. Um, it's, a, it's a snapshot of Q3 revenue for the third quarter, as Cam mentioned, was um, you know 1.36 million of products and 100 and, and 516,000 coming from drone services. Um, so basically, it was a flat quarter, just down 1.1 percent uh, year over year from the same period last last year um looking at gross profits uh decreased by about one hundred and forty six thousand uh, dollars this quarter over the same period last year um, gross margin as a percentage of revenue was a 33.4 percent this quarter versus 40.8 percent in the in the same quarter last year um, that's a result of more sales coming from some lower margin products versus those sold in q3 of last year so as you know, um, you know the sales mix varies from quarter to quarter, and then uh, the total comprehensive loss for the quarter was 4.99 million compared to income of 23.9 million in the same quarter of last year. And for those that follow us, know that there's an accounting treatment where there's a non-cash uh, change in, in fair value derivative that's included in these numbers. So in this quarter, the non-cash gain is 305,000. From that derivative liability um, so the comprehensive loss would have been 5.3 million and if you x out the non-cash change and fair value of, of derivative liability from the same period last year of 30.6 million uh, the loss would have been 6.6 .6 million so the year-over-year -year improvement in the loss was mainly attributed to a decrease in insurance professional fees slightly offset by an increase in, in wages as the company scales um, the, the loss per share would be approximately 16 cents, even, in, you know, including these, um, these variations. So it, it is as reported. Uh, switching to the, the middle table, which is the balance sheet, you can see our total assets are at 29.4 million uh, for the quarter. Um, 
the deployment of cash and reduction of prepaids, you know, is, is probably the main contributor for, for um, you know, the assets there. Um, working capital surplus as at September 30th, 2022 was 18.5 million, um, would have been a surplus of 18.9 million, um, and shareholders equity would have been 27.7 million versus the 26.8 million shown here. Again, if we X out that non-cash fair value of derivative liability of, of 391,000, and we continue to have minimal debt on the balance sheet. Um, as Ken mentioned at the outset, our cash balance at the end of the quarter was 11.7 million. Uh, now looking at the last table on the right, um, we, we just spoke about year over year changes. So now we'll talk about uh, quarter over quarter changes, looking at Q3 this quarter compared to Q2 uh, of last quarter. So revenue for Q3, uh, again, was 1.88 million compared to 2.37 million for Q2 of 2022. Uh, mainly reason here was th there were some lower product sales due to expected timing. So, you know, again, things just where, where the dates land, sometimes it'll, you know, it'll get pushed into the, into the fall quarter. So we think that's, you know, what happened here. Um, on the gross margin percentage, uh, Q3, uh, decreased to 33.4% compared to 42.8% in uh, the second quarter of this year. Again, the decrease is due to the sales mix of, of the products sold. Um, operating expenses for the quarter decreased 2.4% from Q2 of 2022, in part due to lower professional fees and insurance costs. And, and finally, uh, on the total comprehensive loss for Q3 2022, we mentioned 4.99 million was the loss compared to a comprehensive income of $640,000 in Q2 of this year. And again, you'll recall a non-cash change in fair value derivative of 305,000. So if we X that out, Q3 would have had a comprehensive loss of 5.29 million compared to a loss of 5.45 million in Q2 of this year. So making this quarter's loss better than slightly better than that of last quarter. And, and with that, I'll pass it back to you, Ken. That's great, Paul. Thanks very much. Appreciate it as always. So I think the, you know, certainly the highlight uh, for us uh, was the amount of sales activity, which is which is by far uh, greater than we've seen in any other quarter. Uh, we certainly had a number of orders slip somewhat due to um, uh, uh, supply chain matters and somewhat due just to uh, new production uh, capabilities and capacities uh, increasing. Uh, that said, uh, we haven't lost any orders and uh, we are on budget. Uh, so, and and some of this stuff obviously is pushed into uh, Q4. So uh, again, overall, uh, you know, we're on record pace uh, as Q3, um, uh, as our Q3 numbers roll through. And, um, you know, we expect things to, to continue and, and start to accelerate uh, from this point. So maybe what we'll do is, um, I'll just uh, stop sharing here and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Scott Larson, our lead director, uh, to be able to answer any questions. And uh, <clears throat> very fortunately, we have Paul Mullen, who's our chief operating officer here with us as well, who's also available to answer any questions. Scott. Yeah, thanks, Cam. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in. We're fielding questions from kind of two or three different sources, questions that were emailed in before, questions that are coming through in the chat. So. Uh, I'm I'm uh, trying to aggregate these and uh, put them into a single place. So um, bear with us. We'll we'll get through through as many of these questions as we can. A uh, couple here that came in via email uh, just before. Um, are there any acquisitions in the pipeline? And uh, maybe I'll just answer that myself. I think uh, as as Cam's mentioned before, the industry is going through some level of consolidation. I I don't think that's any surprise to anybody out there. Is that uh, just the way the nature of the industry is. Uh, there was a bunch of companies in it. It is going through a consolidation and we get calls from uh, companies who are looking to do a transaction, uh, a, a merger, looking to be acquired, looking for financing, looking for anything, frankly, on a um, incredibly regular basis. So I don't want to... Uh, you know, there's nothing that's being announced, but these are ongoing conversations. We look at a bunch. Uh, we have passed on a bunch. We will keep looking at a bunch. Uh, we'll make the most strategic and tactical decisions we can with regards to acquisitions. 
uh, focusing mainly on, on revenue as opposed to technology, just because we think from a technology standpoint, we're pretty well positioned, but we'll be opportunistic. Um, we'll be opportunistic on all of these. So the short answer to the question is that we are looking at acquisitions. Uh, we look at them all the time. There's nothing that's 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 uh, and that needs to be be announced right now, or is is at that point. But when we get there, um, we'll certainly be announced. And acquisitions are part of our strategy. It's it's part of the mandate that the board has given. It's part of what the industry is going through on its own. And so uh, we will keep looking at that as a uh, on a strategic basis as best we can. Um, Another one here, uh, Cami, I'll pass this one back to you. Can you give an update on the timeline for production and first sales of the DDL contract? Is this Q4? Or is this Q1 next year? What does that look like? Any any thoughts or comments there? Yeah, sounds good. You know, we're we're from a project planning perspective. Uh, we are still targeting uh, Q4 for the the first initial rollout of product. But I think, the, but the, the reality is, it's going to it'll be pushing into Q1, which isn't even remotely entirely unexpected uh, for us before the uh, we actually actually start to see um, some of that uh, generate. And so maybe what I will do is I'll turn it over to uh, Paul a little bit, or not a little bit, I'll turn it over to Paul here uh, to get his comments. Paul? Uh, thank you, Cam. And, and we're continuing to work very actively with the Digital Dream Labs team in, in product development. We've uh, recently seen a new generation of flying uh, prototypes that are reflected uh, reflective of the Cavu character that they're developing. And we are expecting, as Cam mentioned, to start seeing revenue uh, from that uh, partnership through early Q1, uh, likely with some sort of prototype or, or collector edition sale and then scaling up into the larger volumes that were reflected in the initial agreements. Uh, another question here is, can you discuss how you think about the push-pull between investing in the business to drive future growth, growth and the demand for profitability in the near term? So, you know, the, can we both throw this back to you? A couple of comments on... Um, the ongoing discussions that we have between looking to grow the business, looking for future, as well as kind of looking at uh, nearer term in terms of um, improving profitability, keeping costs to a minimum. How do you, how do we think about the balance there? Yeah, so very intricate and, and complex balance, uh, as you know. And I think that the biggest advantage that Dragonfly has in this regard is that we have a very experienced board and we have a very experienced management team that has grown companies from micro cap companies to multi-billion dollar market caps through these product cycles, through through rough markets. So the variables aren't just a matter of, hey, you know, are we going to get more market share by spending more money or are we going to you know get to profitability quicker as, as, uh, as indicated by the question? Uh, it, it's complex. So, you know, if the markets are really good and, you know, they've got an acceptance level around, hey, we want you to get market share, they're robust, there's lots of financing, valuations are high, you know, then you're going to be a bit more aggressive. And, and that's certainly where we were, we were attending, let's call it a year uh, ago. Right. Uh, you know, markets have definitely constrained, pulled back. Uh, so have we in terms of some of our aspirations. Uh, we've been prudent with the uh, cash that we've got. We've been very, very selective around any acquisition talks. And, you know, we are going to, you know, kind of manage that balance. So uh, for us, we have a little bit of a luxurious position uh, be, because uh, we have the ability to organically grow. And it's not, and for us, it's a capacity issue, not a demand. Um, issue. So we'll continue to invest in growing organically, right, with the products that we now have uh, at hand and selectively uh, around uh, the larger initiatives, um, the larger business development initiatives uh, that we have. And that on the acquisition side, we're going to have to be and want to be very, very selective in terms of like, you know, kind of getting, you know, uh, orders of magnitude jump uh, in scale. I think one of the reasons that we have a number of acquisitions that are coming and talking to us is because of our internal processes, because of our internal production capacity, but, you know, because we are we are an organically built business that can scale and can do very well at 20% growth or can now handle 50 or 80 or 100% growth. Um, so I, I would say, I'm trying to answer what I think the question is, is that is that we're going to be a bit more um, uh, cautious uh, around this, uh, be, because you know, capital for the entire market is tight. We're very confident in our plan right now. Uh, I know there's another question in there: How long is our cash good till? Uh, you know, on budget with where we're at right now, we've got cash for next year. 
And, uh, and, you know, candidly, we're financeable. Like that's the, you know, market pricing isn't great right now, but the advantage of that is it's not great for anybody. So there's a real advantage to companies that are financeable right now, even if they do a financing at these lower levels, because then acquisitions, you know, are at a massive discount. So um, anyway, that, that's, a, that's a bit of, uh, uh, yeah, speculation might be the, the wrong word in there, but that's a, it's, a, it's a complex answer to a complex question. Um, we're, we're going to manage it very carefully. Cash is king. Organic sales is most important. And um, that's, that's what we're focused on. Uh, can you discuss how the current sales pipeline directionally, um, how does it compare to, to a quarter ago and a year ago? So it, is the sales pipeline, is it growing? Is it getting smaller? Is the market getting tighter? Maybe just a word or two on that based on kind of last quarter as well as, as, well as 12 months ago. Yeah, so I'll, I'll split the sales pipeline into you know three categories. So uh, the first category, I'll, I'll call it like a, a product skew category, uh, where you know we've got sh we've got products that you know people have, have got familiarity with. They've got a certain spec. They're looking for it to do certain things, and they just need to order it. And so we've got a stronger lineup of that now than we've ever had. So we are starting to see a stronger pipeline, you know, in that particular direction. Now the specific products in that area are the products that we talked about earlier in the presentation. They're tending to be a bit bigger. They're tending to, to, to lean again more towards the sophistication side. And they're tending to be able to be multi-purpose and have multiple solutions around them. So that, that's much stronger. What, what we are seeing a decrease, and it might be just because it's where we're focusing, but I think overall the market is, is not as going to be as robust there, is in that prosumer model. Uh, or, and or there's going to be you know, continued lots of activity with lots of different companies uh, in there. The second category that I'll throw in there is, is uh, uh, services. And so we are seeing uh, our services revenue look to increase. But again, because of the product that we're bringing out actually allows us to provide services or sell product to service companies at a, at a better ROI. So the, in particular, the 3XL just has so many payload capabilities, capacities, right? Where you, now you're buying one drone that can do so many things that, you know, it's the switchblade we're calling it, or not the switchblade, the Swiss army knife um, of the drone uh, space. Uh, and so that's, that's tending to push our services, again, much more in that industrial and that commercial side. I mean, they're looking to use these drones for the demining projects. Like, like two years ago, I wouldn't imagine that we would have had a drone that was so universal and so efficient in that regard. So that that's a trend that we're seeing uh, for us uh, in particular. And then on the solution side, which is the third category, you know, these are the real needle movers. These are the opportunities out there uh, where, um, uh, you know, demining, like an entire industry is wide open uh, for somebody to become, to come in and be the industry uh, leader. And, and there's, you know, a half a dozen of those uh, that we have continued to push forward. There's probably a dozen of them a year ago. And we've pared the, that down probably to about the half dozen range. One, because we want to make sure that we're preserving capital. And two, we want to make sure that we're, we're working on the things that are closest at hand. And so some of those are in the de specific delivery space, not the overall general delivery space, because we think overall general delivery space has still got a ways to go, but there are some very specific opportunities in some areas of public safety and first responder and some different things like that, that are very lucrative, that have budgets applied to them now, will be first in regulation. And so those types of solution sets um, we, we see moving towards it. So it's, again, it's, it's more sophisticated, it's more B2B, it's more kind of industrial, commercial, light military, and again, further away from, you know, fly a drone, get a picture, you know, typical sensors, RGB, thermal, and th those are all just table stakes. Uh, now we see a lot of new entrants in that space and, and we continue to move uh, in that direction, or, you know, away from that and into, our, into the direction that we've described. Um, question here, maybe for Paul Sun. Um, is this level of insurance and professional fees a fair run rate assumption going forward or should we expect these costs to move back higher or upper? And I think mainly uh, regarding uh, DNO insurance and some of the other things we've talked about there. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah. So, so, so when we first w went public um, in the U.S. on the Nasdaq, um, our, our DNO insurance was was quite high. We were a new company on the Nasdaq, so as you can imagine, you know, typical insurance from a premium perspective, it, it was it was high in the market. It is high. The the market um, certainly in 2021 was extremely tight. There was only a handful of of underwriters, um, so everybody had high DNO. Um, now that we've kind of been, um, you know, around for a decent amount of time, um, you know, the insurers kind of view us as, as less of a risk, if you will. 
Um, so as a result, our, our premiums have come down. So, you know, fingers crossed, um, you know, if the market dynamic stays the same within insurance, we, we would hope that it wouldn't, it wouldn't go up or wouldn't go back up. It would kind of stay wh where we are, or if, if anything, continue to go down as we, uh, as, as we continue to operate on the NASDAQ. Um, as it relates to professional fees, um, uh, you know, we are, you know, if you kind of look at our financials, our, our numbers are getting better from a, from a cash burn or, or loss perspective. So we are trying to, um, you know, bring certain functions in house that will, that will, uh, that will lower cost things like, uh, you know, legal as an example, um, would be, would be one where we're kind of, you know, trying to, uh, you know, rein things in and, um, and, and just basically be a bit more thoughtful on, on, um, you know, where, where we spend as we, as we continue to scale the company. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So, a um, couple more questions that have come in here. You know, looking for uh, revenue guidance, looking for a few things like that. I think we'll probably pause on those. Uh, we don't give guidance at this stage. Um, uh, that may happen at some point in the future, but I think we'll, uh, you know, just kind of point people back to our financial statements. Uh, there's all kinds of information in there, and and uh, as opposed to giving revenue guidance, I think we'll probably put that on hold for now. But uh, there is a question here. Can okay, maybe I'll. Uh, maybe I'll throw this back to you and then perhaps I'll give a little color at the end of it. But where is the current product demand coming from? Uh, any interesting industry or product color that um, that you can talk about here outside of some of the stuff we've talked about with regards to Ukraine, particularly, I guess. But are there any other uh, anecdotes or just a little context around where new product demand is coming from? Yeah, so uh, certainly government. Uh, uh, and things uh, at, at all different types of agency levels. So whether it's kind of a light military type thing or whether it's uh, public safety and DFR, right? So drone is a first responder. Um, and so lots and lots of agency work. And so, you know, budgets are now coming through uh, are starting to come through for next year that are incorporating these things. Uh, there's a certain level of regulation that, uh, you know, DFR and different agencies know how to work with now, which is one of the reasons the 3XL was developed, because it can work under a Part 107. Um, so that's a significant area. Industrial-wise, inspection is uh, is growing. Uh, so whether it's a long-form, you know, uh, inspection, you know, pipelines, um, uh, power lines, uh, infrastructure facilities, uh, forestry, uh, you know, inventories, uh, th things like that. That's we're, we're going to continue to see that uh, proven use cases, ROI is there, and now they're just looking for reliable providers and suppliers. Uh, you know, again, typically North American built in order to to, uh, to do and provide that. Uh, and then, in, and in terms of demand, and then I'll let you finish up with it, with uh, uh, Scott is um, uh, is the international. Uh, so that, you know, international is. Um, it, it just continues to surprise me how big and robust that market is. Uh, so if we look at, uh, and, you know, areas like MENA and India, uh, in particular, uh, the demand that's coming out of there for our particular products and expertise, and the, the initiatives that those governments have in place around inspection, surveillance, agriculture, I mean, they're, they're just massive like the numbers are just unbelievable so um but that, that, those are the interesting like near-term things that we see i mean there's other very interesting things longer term uh but right now you know we're trying to keep everything within the perspective of the next year scott and i think part of that is actually just based on uh geopolitics so a number of countries don't want to buy drones that are made in certain countries uh they're looking for north america and they're looking for homegrown they're looking for drones that that you know that kind of fit in with government policy so on top of the regulatory standpoint which is you know the regulatory environment here in in north america is um is more difficult in in certain cases it's more evolved or the rules are there the guidelines are there in some of these other countries they don't they don't quite have the same framework and so this is why you see uh, other drone companies doing large initiatives in Africa for drone deliveries and things like that, that would be frankly impossible here in North America or incredibly difficult. So uh, to Cam's point, um, both from a technology adoption standpoint, as well as the regulatory environment, and frankly, just the whole, just adding the, geopol uh, uh, the geopolitical context on top of that, the demand for North American made drones is, is significant. So uh, we'll continue to participate there. We'll continue to participate in that. We get we get inbound requests on a um, you know daily a stretch, but on a certainly on a regular basis, calls from all over all over parts of the world, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, asking for quotes. You know, just just uh, um, uh, product information, 
uh, can we can we work together to expand the market? So um, we'll keep working our way through that. Those are all difficult conversations. It's on the other side of the planet. It's all uh, kind of tough work. But to Cam's point, some of the stuff that we're doing in Ukraine actually feeds into that. Um, question here, maybe for Paul Mullen, when will the LiDAR uh, product be be available to the uh, to the public? Yeah, thanks, Scott. The, uh, the LiDAR product is uh, is currently available. We're accepting uh, requests for demonstration, et cetera. Our, our sales team is actually um, developing uh, our, our funnel on the LiDAR uh, unit. So we'd certainly be glad to field any requests for uh, further demonstration or technical information on that product. Yeah, okay. So um, a couple more that are coming in here uh, that are all looking for guidance. So I'm just going to kind of revert back to that. Uh, we don't give guidance. Um, Maybe one or two, um, yeah, Cam, but this is probably the last question. This is probably the last question. I think everything else we've, we've, we've actually answered here. Um, maybe talk a little bit about um, where you see the industry going over the next kind of five, six months. Is there Are there short-term uh, dynamics that are in play? We've talked a little bit about some of the regulatory stuff, but outside of the consolidation, uh, do you think this is kind of status quo for the next few months, or is there is there something that here that we can expect? Yeah, I think the uh, the uh, the catalyst events uh, within the industry are uh, regulation uh, primarily. Uh, I think the other uh, the the industry is quite dependent on markets uh, right now because uh, the industry is is in a growth uh, building phase. So the ability to uh, attract or have have capital, have confidence in you is uh, is really important. But uh, but most absolutely most importantly is uh, is execution on a product and service production level and working with customers on a block and tackle level. The the the, the winners in this game, in our opinion right now are going to be the companies that have the best ability to produce product that the customer wants and work on customer solutions. I, I personally believe that Dragonfly's absolute strategic differentiator is that we, you know, I don't, I, that, that we know the customer, that we do what the customer needs. We don't see uh, other executive and, and production team members in the field in various parts of the world and, and with all types of customers as much as you do with Dragonfly. That is absolutely going to be the key. It's We're still in a customer um, education uh, phase uh, of the industry. And, um, and and not that there aren't other, some other companies out there that do it well, but I don't think anybody does it as well as Dragonfly. So I, I, that's it, I, it's not as big and sexy as as uh, as, as we'd like to, to suggest, but it, it's the thing that's going to win this industry. Yeah, I think that's well said. I mean, we're, you know, we talk about this all the time. We're, we're looking to do things, two things. One is just kind of keep growing organically, keep kind of making those numbers. And then to Cam's point, layer on things that actually have the ability to move the needle and change the entire dynamic of the company. And we'll, uh, we'll keep trying to widen the market that we can address through, through some of those. So with that said, this is, uh, this is uh, 45 minutes, which is exactly how we long how long we like these calls to be. Um, we've answered all the questions, uh, some of the ones that have been emailed in. If we've missed any, certainly email in the investor relations and we'll get back to those as soon as we can. Uh, we appreciate this kind of dialogue. Cam, why don't you go ahead and wrap this up and then we'll look to close the call. Yeah, first and foremost, I really want to thank um, our employees uh, for the incredible work and commitment uh, that they've done. Uh, uh, the one thing that uh, I think telltale about Dragonfly is we don't have problem recruiting. Uh, it, it, and and I, I'm really excited about the people personally that I get to work with on, on all levels within the company. And I, I just blown away every single uh, week and month about the things that are being done and how they're being done and how we're looking after customers and the opportunities that are growing out there. It's uh, it's really cool to be a part of. So thanks for that. Um, I also really want to thank uh, uh, the customers that believe in working with us. Many of our customers are shareholders. Many of our customers, uh, you know, share a passion for what this industry will be and for the mission that they're on in internally within their organization and how Dragonfly can be a part of it. And, and these are long-term relationships. And, and, uh, and I obviously really want to thank our shareholders. Um, it has been a very tough market, not just for us, obviously, for everybody uh, over the course of the last year, year and a half. And, um, you know, it, it just feels so nice to be able to sleep well at night, knowing that we're growing the business every single week, that we're increasing customers, that we've got great production teams, that we've got incredible, you know, engineering, and, and that it, it's working, right? We just see the 
process is happening. And, and uh, um, you know, I've been through these cycles before in this industry and with other companies that have become billion dollar organizations. And there's no doubt in my mind that this thing's on the same path. So uh, thanks to everybody for your time, patience and consideration. And uh, we, we look forward to working hard and 